Marriage has brought huge joy to millions of people all through the ages in every different country and culture. One of the reasons for creating this course is so that you too might experience the joy and the benefit of a loving, lifelong marriage. The English broadcaster and talk show host Michael Parkinson, who's been married to his wife Mary for almost 60 years, first saw her on a bus in Doncaster. She was wearing a red duffel coat and he thought she had a face that he could look at forever. In an interview, he commented that no marriage is without its crises and they both felt pleased that they hadn't walked out when things were tough. I just can't imagine divorce, he said. I really can't. I can't contemplate life without Mary. Michael Parkinson says he's done everything he wanted to do and been paid very well for doing it. But he concluded, when you come to the end of your life, having your family intact, that's the really important thing. By contrast, the journalist for The Guardian newspaper wrote recently, the message shouted at us constantly through popular culture is, variety is the spice of life and monogamy is for mugs. I've been tuned in to this unsophisticated, fear-mongering frequency for so long that when my gorgeous boyfriend of 18 months asked me to marry him, instead of shouting I do from the rooftops, I was paralyzed with fear. What if I get stuck? She goes on to say, it turns out that in fact, ecstasy is to be found in commitment. Making a commitment to each other enables us to plan our future together. It allows us to try things out, to get things wrong, to forgive, to have the confidence to raise issues and to make ourselves vulnerable. Commitment is the essence of marriage, its very heart. We're going to start by looking at two consequences of this commitment in marriage. First, forming a deep friendship and then building a strong family life. So first, friendship. As human beings, we have a longing to be known and loved by another person. Mother Teresa famously said, the greatest disease in the West today is loneliness. At the beginning of the Bible, in the account of creation, God says repeatedly, it is good, it is good, it is good. Then suddenly in Genesis chapter two, God says one thing that is not good. It is not good for the man to be alone. And God creates Eve as a companion for Adam. And when Adam is presented with his wife Eve, he says spontaneously these words of deep identification. Here at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. These words are a recognition that we function as human beings in relationship. Now, of course, marriage isn't the only way to counter aloneness, but it is the closest of all human relationships. Marriage joins a couple together in a profound way. The Bible puts it like this. For this reason, a man and a woman will leave their father and mother and be joined to each other, and the two will become one flesh. In the original Hebrew, joined is a very strong word for things or people being united in such a way that they can't easily be separated again. It's that joining together that meets our longing for a relationship, a longing for deep intimacy with another human person and builds a strong bond between us. A second consequence of this commitment we make in marriage is a strong family life. While some couples struggle to conceive and some face the pain of not being able to have children at all, the marriage relationship forms the basis, the foundation of family life. So that love would be right at the center of the family from the outset, God made us in such a way that a child could be created through the act of lovemaking between his or her parents but you've probably realized that already. There's a story of a young boy who was asked to write an essay on his family history. When he got home, he decided to do some research. He approached his mother and asked her, Mum, where did I come from? His mum wasn't quite prepared for the question, so she answered, Well, a stork left you under a bush. The boy then went to his father and asked him, Dad, where did you come from? His dad was equally caught unawares and replied, A stork left me under a bush. The boy then went and asked his grandmother, Granny, where did you come from? Uh, Granny didn't quite feel it was her place to explain the facts of life, so she too replied, Well, a stork left me under a bush. The boy started his essay, There has not been a natural birth in our family for at least three generations. Following God's plan that a child would be conceived in an act of love between his or her parents, 
The ideal for a child is to be born into a home where there's a relationship of committed love between their mother and father. And then to grow up living under the influence of that relationship. Parenting experts often say that the best way parents can love their children is by loving each other. There's no perfect marriage. There are bound to be arguments or disagreements within a marriage, but it's important that children learn that it's okay to have differing opinions. What matters is, you know, coming back together again and forgiving and loving each other. There's nothing wrong in kissing each other in front of your children. Let them see that that's the way things should be done. The way their lives are lived within that context has a significant impact on the child in the long term, in terms of their relationships, their attainments academically, successes in marriages and relationships. Children are visual learners. So what they observe in parents is what they're likely to do rather than what they're told to do by parents. So it's important that parents realize that they have a responsibility as parents to be examples to their children. We'd like you to turn to the first conversation in your journal, The Benefits of Marriage. Spend a few minutes discussing as a couple the question, what in your view is the role of marriage in society? Tell each other what excites you or perhaps frightens you about marriage. Many people today have experienced the acute pain of their parents' relationship failing. And if you know that your partner is carrying pain from their childhood or from a previous relationship, it's important to allow them to express what they feel. And if your own parents have split up, your marriage is an opportunity to do things differently and possibly to break a cycle of failed relationships in your family or in your own life. This feels like a trick question. <laughs> In everyday life, we are quite interchangeable, I would say. It's equal. I mean, yeah. roles do develop. Happy wife, happy life. I'll tell you that right now. But I mean, honestly, it's got to be equal, though. It's a partnership. You have to give your all, both of you. There's not one rule for one person and another for another. All just compromising. Like, if someone takes the bins out, I don't take bins out. But. <laughs> well, I think things have changed now. It's not how it was 100 years ago. I tend to be the organizer because he's just spontaneous. We want to play not necessarily to gender, but to strength. There's certain roles that women are so much more better than, uh, uh, at than the men. Like to Kim. Yeah. No, no, I wouldn't always agree with that. 50-50. <laughs> has to be 50-50. He can't take that much responsibility. <laughs> A healthy marriage involves an equal partnership, within which we work out and then both work to our strengths. Every couple has to work out who does what, who decides what, and who takes the lead on those things that have to be done, such as managing the finances, doing the housework, the cooking, organizing holidays, and so on. While we should always be looking to help each other out with any task, we need to talk about who will take on the main responsibility for a particular role? Or is this responsibility going to be divided 50-50 between us? And you need to discuss how you'll make the very big decisions, such as where you live and how you use your money. Is it going to be one or other of you holding the casting vote, or both of you making these decisions together with an equal say? When responsibilities are unclear, it can so quickly lead to conflict, particularly in the first few years of marriage. Either as we assume we'll organize our marriage in the same way our parents organized theirs, or if we found theirs a bad model, we're determined to do it completely differently from them. We have a very non-traditional household, so we do share ch split chores. When I was thinking of the perfect husband, I thought, oh, it'd be nice if he did that, but I didn't actually think <laughs> that he would do it. One of the things that was news to me was that I was to switch the lights off at night. And I didn't know that that was part of my role. Because that's what my dad did. So yeah. it was just this expectation. Me is really good at certain things. I'm really good at the other stuff. And we trust the other person to take care of that area. 
when it comes to basically running the household, I take care of the finances. Uh, she takes care of the HR issues and the feeding people issues. I hate ironing with passion. I'd had a really long week at work and I was doing the wifely thing and ironing and stuff and it feels like, I just don't bother. And I just stopped and I thought, why am I doing it? And then I realised it was because that's what was done in my home. We set up straight away like we are a team. So yeah. I tend to do a lot of the cooking, you tend to do all the washing. Mm. We never sat down and discussed that. We were both babies in our family. I'm expecting her to do certain things that people did for me. and She was expecting me to do certain things that people did for her. There was a lot of growing that had to be done over uh, a quick period of time. I get a call, Kate's like, the car's broken down. It's rolled to a stop on that I motorway no over why. there. No idea why. I, I leave work, drive in, a, in another car. Got the babies crying in the pull, back. Pull up, Kate's parents in the car with the babies. And it was all because somebody hadn't put petrol in the car. But it's his job, so. <laughs> <laughs> it took Scylla and me several years of marriage to recognize that we had very different expectations about the responsibilities we'd each take on. And that was mainly a result of the ways our parents divided the responsibilities in their respective marriages. So, for example, in my parents' marriage, my father was the main organiser. He loved parties, he planned their social diary, he organised our holidays, he also paid the bills and kept the car filled up with fuel. But in my parents' marriage, it was my mother who was the main organiser. She organised their social lives, she booked the holidays, and she was just as likely as my father to keep the car filled up with fuel. So, when we got married, I subconsciously assumed that Scylla would organise things as my mother had. And I expected that Nicky would organise things just like my father had. It took us ten years of marriage to realise why nothing ever got done, and why the car sometimes ran out of fuel. And then we would blame each other. Well, Nicky would blame silently, I would blame out loud. We were constantly waiting for the other one to take responsibility and organise whatever it was. It really helps to talk about our expectations of who will do what before we get married. Mark. So we went to school together. Um, so I'm a couple of years older than Rach is and uh, you found me really attractive really quickly. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> we lived in a small town, so basically when she got to 18, she realised she didn't have many choices. And I was the best of a bad bunch, basically. That's not true, that's not true. Uh, you were a very good choice. It was really helpful when, before we got married, we just kind of uh, pre-marriage conversations and we talked about then the finances, the housework, and who's going to do those roles. Mm. So I don't like to put the bins out, so you do that, which is very kind of you. It's fine by me. Other than that, I generally don't mind cleaning, so I clean a lot. And I, I love doing the finances, so I, I do that. But it's mainly been around our gift, what we're good at, where our strengths lie, and also perhaps what we enjoy doing. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, Rachel will take a lot of the organisation of life, which I really appreciate. And I tried to kind of keep up to date with, just to honour you, I suppose. Sometimes I send him emails with like, updates on oh, where God, our life is That's really at helpful, or thanks babe. Where our finances um, are at or whatever it is. I suppose I, I probably initiate more with friends and kind of getting stuff together and, and making things social things happen a bit more. Mm. Um, but I think it was really helpful that we had those conversations before we got married around expectations. So we kind of would share the cleaning, we'd share the washing. And I remember one time his parents came to stay and Andy's like doing the washing. And I think your mum was like, what? Yeah. No, I'll do that for you. So even when they come to visit, she If she won't... sees me iron, she's just freaked out. It's <laughs> yeah. hilarious. So when she comes to visit, she kindly does that for you. Well, I, I happily pass it over. I don't love it that much. For the rest of the time, we actually wanted to split split a lot yeah. of things based on are we good at it, do we enjoy it, and also some stuff we don't enjoy we just share. So where does this idea of marriage as an equal partnership come from? Actually, we take this idea from the Bible and particularly from the New Testament. That's because Christian teaching has been the single most significant factor in the increasing liberation of women through the years and for the marriage relationship coming to be seen as an equal partnership of mutual giving. The Bible showed couples a radical new way of living together. St. Paul wrote about the marriage relationship, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, submission doesn't mean being passive. Submitting to each other is the opposite of demanding things of each other. 
or lording it over one another, or seeking to control the other, all of which are highly damaging to a marriage relationship. Rather, submitting to each other means seeking to put each other first, to put each other's needs before our own. At the time when the culture was one of male dominance, where the husband had total rights over everyone in the household, including his wife, St Paul goes on to write these astonishing words. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Loving like this is very active and involves making sacrifices for the sake of the other. And this was incredibly countercultural. It was revolutionary and has slowly led in many parts of the world to the liberation of women and an acceptance of the equality of the sexes. The Bible portrays the marriage relationship as not being about our rights, but rather about our responsibility to express love through serving each other. This will mean one or other of us taking the lead at different times. But taking the lead is very different to making all the important decisions or seeking to take control, which can lead to physical or emotional abuse. Submitting ourselves to one another's needs is still the key to a loving marriage, to a strong partnership. We were both raised in single parent homes, so that me and all of our sort of extended family were single parents. So there was there was no model for what mm. a joint couple was supposed to look like. I come from a family of a lot of very strong independent women and very few men. Like they just did what they wanted to do and they were kind of the authority on whatever they wanted to do. There was no collaborative anything. So I had lived alone, made all these independent decisions, you know, so there was never any body right. that I had to run anything behind, you know? So so that I think that was the weird thing for me is figuring out, you know, how to, how to do that. My mom, she had two boys. We didn't really have a father figure. You go through that growing up saying either I'm gonna be like this or I'm never gonna do that. When I grow up, I wanna be the man in my house. I don't wanna be told what to do. And, and it was different once we got married. I'm, I'm like, okay. So it's a collaborative effort. So culturally, you know, uh, as, a, as a Latin man, uh, you, you don't cook. You know, it's not that you were brought up with mom cooking. So when we got married, uh, we, we came home from work and it was so funny because I was expecting to have food ready. We both came home and like stared at each other. What's for dinner? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, what's for dinner? <laughs> I asked her, I was like, have you thought about what we're gonna eat today? And she said, I haven't. <laughs> and I thought, how could you not think about what we're gonna eat? And I said, have you? He said, yes. I'm like, then, then you do the cooking. <laughs> and so he has for 11 years now. I just saw it as an opportunity to create, but culturally yeah. it, it was a fight because my response that day was, well, my mom's cooked her whole life. And she's like, don't you ever bring your mom up again. Like, it's not balance, it's we're a team. Yeah. And sometimes I'm gonna lift more, sometimes you're gonna lift more. She does so much more that I can't even catch up to everything she does that nobody sees. Mm -hmm. And so I try to always celebrate her. And honestly, like me submitting to him, but it's like him submitting to, to me as well, yes, because other. we're a team. So is there a difference between male and female? Certainly we're created equal but different. And the differences in gender are regarded in the Bible as a deliberate and good part of God's creation. However, when we try to define exactly what those differences are, it is very hard, if not impossible, to stand outside our own culture and to distinguish differences in the way we're created from differences because of our cultural expectations. These differences between us in gender are real and are to be celebrated, as they have the potential to enhance our relationship. And importantly, we're never to use a difference as an abuse of power, particularly if one of us is physically or intellectually stronger than the other, but rather to use our differences to serve each other. That might mean if your wife is having a baby, being a great protector, or if your husband is unwell, being a great carer. In this way, you use your differences, whether in physical strength or intelligence, or your superior way with words, to help the other, rather than to subjugate, control, or abuse. 
When our attitude is to serve each other, we take the initiative in some areas while we support in others. And after a while, we discover which responsibilities we're each best suited to. Now, after Nikki and I got over constantly expecting the other to organize things, we learned to operate much better as a team, and particularly through both of us working to our strengths. An example of that for us is around showing hospitality, which we both love. So when we have people in our home for a meal, we divide up the responsibilities as to what we each enjoy and what we're each best at. So I do most of the cooking because I love cooking, while Nikki likes tidying up, setting the atmosphere, laying the table, lighting candles, and generally making our home look really welcoming. Now, which responsibilities you each take on will be different for every couple and will probably change over the years, perhaps through unemployment or maybe as a result of an illness or with the arrival of children. We'd like you to turn in your journals to the next conversation dividing responsibilities, which could be the most revealing conversation you have on this whole course. It's designed to help you work out what expectations you and your partner have for the roles each of you would fulfill if and when you get married. So be honest. First, write down up to six areas for which you expect to take responsibility, then up to six areas for which you expect your partner to take responsibility, and then up to six areas that you expect will be a joint responsibility. We've put some examples in the journal to help you get started. Do it on your own and then show each other what you've put. And one tip, we suggest you write down at least as many responsibilities for yourself as you write down for your partner. Almost everybody who's getting married believes that marriage is about love. But what does love mean in a marriage? People often talk about love in terms of their feelings, and they're referring to the feeling of being in love, over which we have little or no control. This is infatuation, which is a chemical process that, according to psychologists, can last anything from three minutes to three years. These feelings are great, but in any marriage, they will come and go. Sadly, many people today think that when this kind of love stops, when they stop having these powerful feelings, or they suddenly feel them towards someone else, the relationship is over, and so they split up. That is so sad, because there's another kind of love that is deliberate and intentional, that's not just based on our feelings, but on what we do. The author C.S. Lewis wrote, love, as distinct from being in love, is not merely a feeling, it is a deep unity, maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit. It is on this love that the engine of marriage is run. Being in love was the explosion that started it. A friend of ours had a letter published in the national press. I have learned that the roller coaster of my emotions isn't a good indicator of the health of our marriage. What works is treating our marriage as our most precious possession and investing time in it. That translates into my willingness to be wrong, to spend time doing fun things together, to listen to my wife when I have a lot of things to do, to help her out even when I'm busy, not to score points, not to blame her for everything that goes wrong in my life, and to wait for a good moment to discuss difficult issues. So the fact that we're more in love than ever is no accident. While we can't control infatuation, we can nurture that other deliberate kind of love. And the marriage vows that form the basis of a wedding create the setting for it. In marriage, we enter into a covenant relationship with another person. A covenant is different to a contract. A contract, as any lawyer will know, is a legal document that outlines the rights and duties of each party and defines precisely the kind and amount of service being offered by each side. But the covenant relationship of marriage is much deeper and is based on the couple's promises to love each other. The covenant we make when we get married is a decision to give ourselves to each other in love. And it's then a decision we reinforce day by day. 
my aim is to wake up each morning and to love this person who is lying beside me, that's Scylla for the avoidance of any doubt. Whether she's well or ill, whether we have money or we're broke, whether things are going my way or they're not, whether I'm feeling happy or feeling grumpy with Scylla or about anything else, or whether she's feeling irritated with me. Now, admittedly, I achieve my aim a lot better on some days than others, but that's the day-to-day -day journey of marriage. The marriage covenant holds us together when we go through tough times, as we all do. For many couples, the first few years of their marriage can be particularly challenging. We're discovering all the things that we were blind to when we were infatuated. We're having to adjust and to change. And when you're going through a difficult stage, we want to urge you to fight for your marriage. Don't give up. If you persevere, you can come through those times much closer in your love and stronger in your marriage. An American study showed that the vast majority of couples in difficult marriages who didn't divorce ended up in good marriages. Recently, I read the story of a couple whose marriage had very nearly failed, so much so that they barely acknowledged each other anymore. One day, the husband broke down in the shower. He realized there was nothing he could do to change his wife. He'd been trying for over 20 years, but he could make some changes himself. The next morning, he asked his wife, how can I make your day better? She was very surprised and quite suspicious at the sudden change. So she tested him. She asked him to clean the kitchen, which he did. The next morning, he asked her the same question. How can I make your day better? Clean the garage, she replied. It was a big job and he had a busy day, but he did as she asked. The following day, he asked her again, how can I make your day better? This time she told him there was nothing, but he persisted. He asked her every morning for two weeks. Finally, his wife broke down and said, I should be asking you that. She apologized and said, can we just spend some time together? Now, every day, the couple ask each other how they can make each other's day better, and their marriage has been totally transformed. The question, how can I make your day better, sums up what the marriage vows are about. Not focusing on what our partner can do for us, but on what we can do for them. The marriage vows are challenging, but the more we decide to act in a loving way, the more our feelings will follow. The powerful words of love that we speak to each other on our wedding day, the promises we make of faithfulness, forgiveness, perseverance, to love, to cherish, to stick by each other, whatever circumstances we come up against, build a foundation of trust between us and become the protective casing around our relationship. It's liberating to know that Scylla and I can disagree passionately, as we often do, and Scylla won't walk away. An argument doesn't mean the end of our marriage. The marriage vows bring deep security and provide us with a safe space within which we're able to be open and vulnerable with each other. They give us the confidence to allow our partner to know us as we are, including revealing those parts we keep well hidden. And that builds intimacy. As one woman said, it's not so much love that sustains our marriage as our marriage that sustains our love. We want you to turn to the next conversation called The Marriage Vows and read through them. Now, don't worry, you won't be married at the end of this. You need a few other things in place like witnesses. Then, each of you decide which word or phrase or sentence is the most important for you and try to explain your choice to your partner. For the rest of this session, we want to focus in on two practical applications of the marriage vows that are critical for living out these vows in day-to-day -day life, and which, if they're handled well, cause a marriage to flourish, but when not handled well, have caused marriages to fail. So, the first area is how we deal with our finances. How do a couple make decisions about money? How do they decide what they spend their money on? How do they decide how much they save? 
And who's going to manage their finances? Marriage involves sharing everything. It's right there in the marriage service. The bride and groom say to each other, all that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. And sometimes that's easier said than done. I remember a friend who'd been married about a year saying to me, I was fine with money until I had to share it. Every couple needs to set aside time to discuss their finances, and not just once, but on an ongoing basis, with a clear understanding between them about how they'll manage and use their money. If we're going to achieve that, we have to make a plan together. Being able to talk about money, being able to work out how you are both together going to look at, deal with, budget, decide what you spend, decide what you give, decide what you save. These important decisions are absolutely vital. Creating a budget is a really, really important basic step in any couple dealing with their finances. And the way that you create it is really simple. You find some time and you commit some time to actually looking at what do you have to spend each week or normally each month, i.e. your rent, your electricity, your gas, the insurance. Are you gonna go on holiday? Are you gonna buy some clothes? And you basically simply add it all together. Divide it out over a 12 month and find out each month how much money do you need to spend and how much money do you want to spend? And if you then discover that there is not enough to do what you have to do, or enough to do what you want to do, it's not an upsetting thing, it's an empowering thing. You have a problem, but these problems can be solved. This is where you have to start to make some decisions. You can either cut things out, you can cut back on things, and you can cut costs. Those are the only three things you can do. And working through your budget will make a huge difference. And the couples that do budgets are the couples that get their money under control and are not controlled by the money itself. Finances can either pull us apart or draw us together. In discussing your finances, it's helpful to compare your feelings about money. Ask yourself, does money fascinate you or bore you? Does it make you feel anxious or confident or excited or guilty or out of control? And the aim in marriage is to develop a dynamic partnership in which we double the experience and wisdom that we bring to managing our finances and work on them together as a team. And it's well worth agreeing how much you can spend without consulting your partner. Previously, Scylla and I hadn't done that. Years ago, we were given a generous gift of money out of the blue by a very kind friend. We put it in our joint account and I wondered how we might use it. Then one day, Scylla told me she'd spent the whole lot on joining a gym. I was horrified, partially because we hadn't discussed it, but also because I suspected that Scylla wouldn't get her money's worth out of it. She didn't. She went a total of four times. They were some of the most expensive visits to a gym ever. Well, it definitely wasn't only four. I, I know it was at least six times. And I really thought I was doing it for Nikki's benefit as I had just had our fourth child and I was seriously out of shape. So the next conversation in your journal is discussing your finances. This conversation may reveal that what's an important issue regarding money for you may not be for your partner and vice versa. Spend a few minutes filling in your answers and then discuss what you've each put. A second important area for working out our marriage vows is how we relate to our parents, parents-in-law, and our wider family. We've already mentioned Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man and a woman will leave their father and mother and be joined to their husband or wife. We want to look at what this leaving really means in practice. Our situations are all different. For some of us, our parents are around and live nearby, while for others, they aren't. Some of us have great relationships with our family, while for others, it's more difficult. Whatever our situation, when we get married, our relationship with our parents must be different to the way it was as we were growing up. 
In marriage, our first loyalty is now to our husband or wife. There needs to be a new center of gravity in our lives. When we're young, our home is like our center. As we grow up, we move out in wider and wider circles of exploration and independence, learning to walk, going to school, gaining more freedom as a teenager, eventually becoming an independent adult, and for many people, living away from home for the first time. But even for those who leave home, the center can continue to be their parental home, emotionally and in other ways. And they may return for comfort, encouragement, money, advice, or just to get their laundry done. But once we get married, there needs to be a shift in our thinking. Our marriage relationship becomes our new center of gravity. It's the first place we look to for comfort, security, and affection. It took us a little while after we got married to adjust to where we called home, but it was an important transition for us. Now, of course, this leaving won't be a question of geography if you're still living in the same house as your parents. However, there still needs to be a psychological and an emotional adjustment that takes place when we get married. And we mustn't underestimate what a massive change this is, particularly if there's ongoing emotional dependence by one of us on a parent or the other way around. And we may be used to talking on the phone with a parent frequently, perhaps many times a day, about every aspect of our life. There's been a deep emotional connection, and that's not a bad thing. But after marriage, the emotional connection must first be with our husband or wife. I've always had really deep relationship with my mom, and we've always been more best friends than mother and daughter. And I really tr had to work hard when we moved to Scotland and started our grown-up life together as a family, mm -hmm. what to tell my mom, what not to tell, how to see it properly so I can still have that great relationship with her, but any sort of problems between us, any sort of arguments that we would have between us, I had to deal with Michael, talk to him about it rather than going to my mom and talk about Michael behind his back. I had to be vocal and I, I, it, it took me a while to be actually brave enough and say it loud, like, listen, I'm not really happy about you sharing everything that we had, that we are discussing with your mom. I need to know that what we are, when we are talking, you are speaking out through your heart, not that someone told you to say this or that to me. Because that was usually the case that if if something happened, I would mm -hmm. pick up the phone and kind of talk about our situation with my mom. And obviously the image would stay with my mom for much longer than it stayed with me. Mm -hmm. Because we would come to an agreement after five minutes and then my mom would still feel yeah. Yeah, kind of grinch so about Michael not being nice to me or to feel, fulfill my expectations. Some of you will feel deeply challenged by putting in a boundary with a parent. The principle of making our partner our first loyalty is essential for a healthy marriage. But prioritizing our marriage doesn't mean we stop loving or respecting our parents. We put in boundaries where necessary as kindly and sensitively as we can. The commandment in the Bible to honor our father and mother doesn't cease to be valid once we're married. And parents may well have much valuable advice to pass on and Personally, Nikki and I have gained a huge amount from talking to our parents and learning from them. But we discovered early on how important it was for us to make our own decisions together as a couple, rather than deciding on something directly with a parent and sidelining each other. And this applies to both large and small decisions, such as the decoration of your home, how you spend your time, how you use your money, the tidiness of your home, your choice of holidays, and the way you bring up your children. And often, it's the relatively small and mundane decisions that can cause the biggest issues for couples. I remember a newly married woman telling us how one day when she was out at work, her husband and his mother moved some of the furniture around in their home. Now, she was amazed by the strength of her own reaction when she got home and discovered what they'd done. It wasn't that she objected to where they'd put the furniture. If anything, it was an improvement. It was that the decision had been made by her husband and his mother, rather than by them as a couple. 
having made our own decisions, we then need to support each other in those decisions, even if they're different to the views of our parents or parents-in-law. And it's worth recognizing that this is often hardest in our own parental home. That was certainly an area of difficulty for us. I wasn't always very good at supporting Scylla or standing by what we'd decided. My mother was a very strong character. So like me, Nikki's mum was at the rhino end of the spectrum. So we had quite a few clashes over all sorts of things, many of them really trivial in retrospect. Uh, like the occasion when we were staying with my parents-in-law and I wanted to put an egg into the mashed potatoes. Well, Nikki's mother, who was definitely a saver, which is probably where Nikki gets his tendency from, thought that that was very extravagant, which I thought was ridiculous. So we had this standoff over one egg. My tendency was to try hard to keep the peace and sometimes it seemed easier to side with my mother, particularly as with regard to this incident, it was her egg. But siding with a parent rather than with our partner never works. We all need to be aware that parents, usually out of love and concern for us, may try to influence us around to their opinions. But in so doing, they can drive a wedge between us as husband and wife. This principle of making our own decisions applies even if we're living in the same house as a parent or we're their primary carer. Our aim in marriage is to build mutually supportive relationships with our parents and our parents-in-law, rather than sidelining them or being controlled by them. We recognize some of you may have a difficult relationship with a parent or your wider family. But still, we'd encourage you to take a long view and to persevere in doing what you can to build these relationships. And if you're engaged, one way you could get things off to a good start is to show your gratitude by writing them a letter or giving them a present before your wedding day to thank them for all they've done for you. Your relationship with them will also be helped by taking the initiative to stay in touch out of consideration and respect for them. Decide together how often you're going to ring your parents, how regularly you're going to visit, if you plan to go on holiday with them, and generally how much involvement you expect to have in each other's lives. Take one. Mark it. Mark it. 就跟父母的年纪是一直存在的像是做客的这种感觉客人的感觉然后有的时候还会和他的父母有会有一些小的冲突啊然后就会累积一些负面的情绪但因为我是刺猬型嘛累积在心里面有的时候就会产生一些不好的破坏到我们夫妻的关系
很好的来，嗯，照顾到他们，然后更好的来孝敬他们。So the next conversation in your journal is called "Parents and In-laws." Discuss as a couple what possible areas of tension you can foresee from the list you'll see there, and then think about how you might go about resolving them. Many people have talked to us about how they've been taken by surprise by the difference that getting married and making those vows to each other has made to their relationship. Some people think of marriage as tying them down, restricting their freedom, but thousands and thousands of married couples have experienced the opposite. One man wrote to us. Almost immediately after getting married, I discovered that far from feeling bound, restricted, or trapped, I felt joyful, peaceful. And free, gone is the possibility of an end. Gone is the not being entirely sure of what's on the other side of an argument. Instead, a deep peace that now, with all my eggs firmly in one basket, the real adventure could begin. The passage we've chosen for this session from the list in your journal comes from the Song of Songs, which is a love song that comes right in the middle of the Bible. Where two lovers describe their feelings for each other and call each other into this covenant relationship that we've been describing, here's what it says: My beloved spoke and said to me, "Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land, the fig tree forms its early fruit." The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. As we finish this session, I'd like to say a prayer for you as you go forwards together. Lord, we thank you for the gift of marriage. Thank you for the powerful promises of love that bind us together in this lifelong covenant. Please help each couple who get married. To build a strong partnership, to support each other through all the challenges of life, and to establish homes that are safe places for children to grow up in. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you on the next session. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you don't. Yeah, you don't. Me? You're making it worse. You're definitely making it worse. No, I'm not. <laughs> that okay? Your face. <laughs> I was like, you're like. <laughs> I don't really remember the question now. <laughs> um. Um. So what? What's the? Uh, what's what, of what? What are we doing? Can you repeat the question? What's the question again? <laughs> And. Sorry. Say again. Sorry. I don't remember the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> What was the question? What was the question? <laughs> What was I saying? Uh, you two bad parents and arguing, <laughs> and they're okay, amazing. Oh yeah. Okay. Are you live on Instagram? Hi, mom. <laughs> sorry. We're laughing before you can even finish the question. Yeah. <laughs>